Taylor here. I want to let you know that this is a shortened version of the full podcast episode again. If you want the full episode with all the secrets, all the stories, and the bonus ending, please head over to Apple Podcasts and subscribe and download the episode there. That would be amazing. If you're on an Android device, please subscribe and download the episode on Google Podcasts. We made it extra slick and put those links in the description below. Thanks so much for supporting us. Here's what we have coming up today. But there is a big secret about pumpkin spice. Turkeys yeah. are very, very tricky, and you need to shoot them in the head. Yeah. Magic. Yeah, all the magic pumpkins. And crack open the nuts and separate out the nut meat. It went viral as a gif into the water, and there was that, that moment of panic, like, I'm drowning, I'm going to die. I have thrown, thrown up, like, at least eight times, and that's probably the highlight of the trip. That's super adorable and also disturbing. <laughs> Hey, I'm Taylor. I'm on my way to meet Andy. This is what he sounds like. Hi, my name is Andy. Welcome to Simply Complex. We have a great episode for you today. We're gonna be talking about Thanksgiving, pumpkins, and we'll even give you a couple ideas of ways to deflect conversations about the midterms at your Thanksgiving dinner. In today's modern world, we are always in such a hurry. We rarely stop to think about the things that keep the gears turning. On Simply Complex, we explore the people, technologies, items, and processes that, while at one point were considered outstanding, have today become so commonplace, we take them for granted. While we are looking into pumpkins and Thanksgiving and how they're all tied together, Brian took his nephews out to hunt some pumpkins. When you think about pumpkins on Thanksgiving, you think pumpkin pie. But just like the changing leaves on the trees trigger our brains into fall mode, the arrival of pumpkins at Halloween let us know that pumpkin pie is not too far away. How interesting that right before pumpkin pie season, there's this holiday that requires millions of fresh pumpkins to hit the market. Is this coincidence? Or is it a long-tail conspiracy coordinated by the pumpkin lobby to keep pumpkins a viable commodity? Things to ponder. This past Halloween, I took my nephew and his friend pumpkin hunting for the very first time. Since I don't have kids of my own, I'm not often around the wide-eyed perspective of a young person. So I was surprised when I heard the criteria of a 12-year-old in finding the perfect pumpkin. Have arrived. Have arrived at the place of the place. Pumpkins! <laughs> the steps to finding the perfect pumpkin are as follows. One. Establish your Very search criteria. Lots. Very lots of pounds. What are your criteria when you're looking for the pumpkin that you want? I usually like pumpkins around the middle. For me, I want it to be either as big as possible or as small as possible. And if it's as big as possible, then I can hug it better. Two, narrow the scope of your search. It has lots of bumps. Looks like an old man, almost. Whatever that Gourds means. look better with bumps and pumpkins don't. I'd agree with that statement. And three, weigh all your options and make your decision. So now it's time for you guys to pick your pumpkin that you're gonna take with you. <gasps> oh my gosh, this is amazing. <laughs> looks good. It looks very good. How huggable is it? Let me test. Right, <laughs> it's the hug test. <laughs> it's very huggable. It is like perfectly huggable. You wanna get that one? We shout. Okay. We shout to get it. Can I get another one for pie? Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. All right, so you got two. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now that the perfect pumpkin is found, it's time to check out. We've done well. We've done very well. $35 later, and we're on our way home. I'm not sure if these pumpkins are going to make it all the way to Thanksgiving. But I can tell you one thing. I'm for sure doing this again next year. Happy Thanksgiving, Andy. Happy Thanksgiving. November is almost over. Do you know what that means? It's almost winter. We can start hibernating. Yeah, but it also means that it's finally the okay week to be all excited about pumpkin spice. That's limited to one week? Yep, just like Christmas music. <laughs> but there is a big secret 
Well, it's not really a secret, but there is a little-known fact about pumpkin spice. There's no actual pumpkin in pumpkin spice. I was so surprised when I found this out. What is actually used to make pumpkin spice? So it's the normal spices you would put and do a pumpkin pie. Cinnamon, nutmeg, ginger, cloves, um, and then you just put that into a latte with lots of sugar. And food coloring. Yeah. And then, ta-da, we have fake pumpkins for pumpkin spice. Do you know where pumpkin spice actually came from, though? I don't. So when Cinderella was going to the ball, she had a cup of tea in her hand. And so when she got into the pumpkin carriage, uh, it magically turned into a pumpkin spice latte. I'm going to need a fact check on that one. Oh, no, it's it's real. <laughs> I promise. So do you also like pumpkin pie? Yeah, I feel like it's a staple of the holiday, and uh, I enjoy having it. My favorite part about pumpkin pie is we always would put it in the fridge overnight after Thanksgiving, and then I would have it cold for breakfast the day afterwards. For breakfast? Yeah, because I felt like, hey, this is like a squash thing. <laughs> I can justify this. <laughs> it's a bit of a stretch, I think. <laughs> oh, it's okay, though. With whipped cream, even? Oh, yeah, with whipped cream, even. <laughs> it's like milk. It's like cereal. Yeah, it's totally, it was better than cereal. Come on. <laughs> Do you have a pumpkin spice latte with it? That would be too much pumpkin. <laughs> no, it's only one of them has pumpkin. Oh, that's true. If I got a piece of pumpkin pie, put it in a bowl, and then poured a pumpkin spice latte <laughs> on it, that would be the truest balanced breakfast. When we come back, Brian shares some interesting political history about Thanksgiving. All right, I need to change lanes here. With all that's going on currently in our nation, you may be dreading the thought of politics making an appearance at Thanksgiving this year. But here's a thought. Should your drunk uncle start spouting off about the midterms, why not divert the political conversation to the politics of Thanksgiving? That's right. When we think of Thanksgiving... It's usually about the pilgrims and Native Americans who greeted them on this continent. But Thanksgiving as a national holiday throughout history was a bit of a political football. We won't delve into how things evolved between the pilgrims and Native Americans here, though that is a whole other story. Although President George Washington proclaimed the first national holiday of Thanksgiving in 1789, it wasn't celebrated annually nor consistently on the same date for quite some time. For the first half of the 1800s, Presidents would appoint various dates as a national holiday of Thanksgiving in an attempt to bring the country together during periods of war or civil unrest. It was in the middle of the greatest political upheaval of our country, the Civil War, that most likely prompted Abraham Lincoln to proclaim Thanksgiving as a national holiday to be held every year on the last Thursday of November. That ritual held until 1939, when, during the Great Depression and under pressure by the retail industry, President Franklin Roosevelt moved Thanksgiving a week earlier to extend the Christmas shopping season. This put him at odds with his Republican Congress, who said it was an affront to the memory of Lincoln. That next year, November 23rd was called Democrat Thanksgiving, or Franksgiving, and November 30th was called Republican Thanksgiving. But thankfully, in a show of bipartisanship that we can all hope to see again, in 1941, Roosevelt and his Congress came together to designate the fourth Thursday of November, Thanksgiving, forevermore. So Thanksgiving is a holiday where inevitably somebody's stuck in the kitchen all day making the meal completely from scratch. Can you imagine if that person not only had to cook everything from scratch, but they also had to grow and source everything from scratch? Well, that's what Andy did. The average American spends around $50 on a Thanksgiving meal and around eight hours to actually make it. But if you really wanted to be cheap and lazy, you could easily make it in just 15 minutes for under $25. But what if you wanted to take it to the other extreme by hand harvesting all of your own ingredients? Well, let's find out. So I brought Andy back into the studio to talk about the time where he made Thanksgiving dinner completely from scratch. Yeah, so that was actually it was our first project we did specifically for YouTube. Before that, all of our content had been intended for local television, which we first started out on. This was the first one after we kind of transitioned and found a new home there. I think around October, we decided, let's do Thanksgiving. So it gave us about a month to do it. We had a hard deadline of getting it up before Thanksgiving. It was kind of an opportunity to revisit some of the things with the sandwich, where instead of like growing things, we might visit a few farms. I could do things like the sugar beets, which I tried to grow for the sandwich, but never was able to get them to sprout. So um, I was excited to be able to revisit that and actually harvest some. What were the sugar beets for? The sugar beets were for the cranberry sauce. 
which is basically two ingredients, more or less, cranberries and sugar. Mm-hmm. Cranberries, we got to stop in Wisconsin at the supposed capital of cranberries, Warren, Wisconsin. We got to catch them on their mid-harvest. I thought what was interesting is that cranberries don't actually grow in a pond. They're actually dry. And it's just when they're ready to harvest, they flood it, and then the cranberries will float, and that makes it easier to harvest. That's why every picture I see or video I see of cranberries is just in a huge bog. Mm-hmm. And it's all kind of controlled. So it's lots of lands that like they can control the flooding and uh, make it really efficient. They didn't give me a set of waders, but I didn't let that stop me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> the, what happened next is kind of the uh, second viral occurrence that I ran into. And it, this one... It went viral as a GIF, which is not directly connected to us. I feel like there's a lot of people out there who have seen it, but they don't know it's me. Yeah. And the story behind it is we shot all this great B-roll of them harvesting the cranberries, and then it's like, oh, I should probably get some myself. I guess I'll just reach down and like grab some from the bog. And it's got these steep cliffs on the sides of it because they flood it. I go down, a little wobbly, grab a couple, and, and then uh, Chris on the camera is like, let's do another take. I was like, okay, go down a little bit more wobbly, grab it. Okay, cool. We're good, right? Like, one more time. (laughs) Do it again. And I just start to lose my balance, and I start to go forward, and I start grabbing for whatever I can, and there's nothing there, and I just go head first (laughs) into the water, and there's that that moment of panic of, like, I'm drowning, I'm going to (laughs) die. And then I finally, like, got something I could hold on to and pull myself back out, and if you watch the full clip, I actually come out just laughing hysterically <laughs> at my own own fate. <laughs> then from the cranberries, what was next? Then it was a stuffing. Okay. For that, we went to a slightly different direction where I grew wheat for my sandwich to make bread. Decided to explore an alternative, which was acorns. So at the acorns, we uh, actually went to Michigan, which... Doesn't make sense because acorns are here, but we're also going there for sassafras for a root beer float episode. So we're already working with this uh, forager, Lisa Rose. So it worked out well. So we ended up taking the ferry from Wisconsin to Michigan, and it was almost canceled because of wind. We were going to be disappointed because then we have to take a long drive around the lake. Fortunately, they let us go on it. With large air quotes around (laughs) fortunately. Yeah. All right, so we just took a cruise across Lake Michigan. It made me super nauseous. Like, I had no idea I would I would get seasick before this, but apparently I do. It's been horrible. And I just started vomiting over and over and over again. I have thrown, thrown up, like, at least eight times, and that's probably the highlight of the trip. Because after I throw up, I actually feel decent. Oh, my God. I wish I was dead made me feel so nauseous that I like, forced myself to vomit at times just to survive and not feel so horrible. Then we got off the boat and we met Lisa there and she was so sweet. She like was like, oh no, that's horrible. And she like had like some herbal remedies ready for me for uh, an upset stomach. And I was like, that's oh perfect. yeah. And then I had to collect myself after vomiting my guts out. <laughs> <laughs> And then we went out and collected acorns, and she showed me how to process them. I like to process my acorns uh, with the end result to make acorn flour. It's basically equivalent to wheat flour? Very different to wheat flour. So wheat flour has the gluten. The acorn flour, of course, is a, is a nut flour. You have to compensate and adjust your quantities if you want um, it to be leavened or, or that sort of thing. What's the next step now to turn into the flour? So we'll just want to go ahead and crack open the nuts and separate out the nut meats. The next step is grinding. A simple coffee grinder can take those nut meats to process them up into flour. And you can easily do you know, several quarts of dried nut meats using a coffee grinder, and those can be stored then in the freezer, and you can pull it out to use as needed. So then I used a coffee grinder, like she recommended, ground the nut meat, as she called it, into a finer powder, and then mixed it up with the flour and the butter, and uh, baked it into loaf, then cut that guy up, added in some herbs and some mushrooms, and made this really delicious stuffing out of it. Mm, Smells nutty. So while the bread was in the oven, you went to kill the turkey. Yeah, <laughs> exactly how it happened. <laughs> for help getting my wild turkey, I turned to Don Elwanger, owner of American Heritage Hunting Club, for some assistance on hunting my own turkey. 
So I'm here at a turkey hunt. How does turkey hunting compare to like deer hunting or other types of hunting? Well, turkey hunts are always adventures. You yeah. never know quite what's going to go on. It's never guaranteed. Turkeys yeah. are very, very tricky and okay. you need to shoot them in the head. Yeah. They have just huge bones and wings and that like body armor, unless you're very close to them, it's just not going to do much good. Are they pretty fast? Well, they're fast, but they're going to disappear and hide on you like, oh, yeah. like a piece of bark. Here comes your turkey. Put him right in the head. It looks like I got him in the head. So a good, clean shot, I hope. Andy, yeah, heard a couple of them. One yeah. miss? Yeah, I think I hit him with both. Pretty looking bird. Yeah, it'll be a dandy one in the oven. <laughs> so that was the last and most important ingredient and ready to put it all together. So had you made a full Thanksgiving dinner before? Uh, not to this extent, but I, I have hosted Thanksgiving and made my own turkey. This went a little bit further, but I feel like I kind of had an idea of what to do. Hey, thank you for listening today. We hope you enjoyed the show. Please have a great holiday weekend, no matter where you are. If you want to hear what you missed in today's shortened version of this podcast episode, and there's 15 minutes more and a bonus ending, please head over and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts. There's some links below, so it's super easy. Feel free to skip to the end for that bonus, but subscribing and telling us how much you like it with a rating really helps us connect with more awesome people like you. I also want to thank our experts, Lisa Rose, Don Elwinger, and Yia Vang. If you're interested in any of the resources we mentioned, we'll be including pumpkin included recipes and some further reading in our description and show notes. You can check out those at makeeverything.tv forward slash simply complex. Also, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to shoot us a message at podcast at makeeverything.tv. And we also have a PO box if you want to send us your ideas snail mail style. You can reach us at How to Make Everything, P.O. Box 14104, St. Paul, Minnesota, 55114. And we can't wait to hear from you. Thanks to Andy and Brian for helping me out and Studio 71 for making this possible. Thank you so much for supporting us. Andy's releasing a video about making a drum from scratch really soon, too. We look forward to next time. See you soon.